E Back to the Future. This presentation is prepared for the Tech Heads BCS session on the new E Back and educational technology for educators and entrepreneurs sharing thoughts on Wednesday, October the 24th, 2012. I'm now a disruptive nostalgist living in Wimbledon. E, but I come from York. That by way of the only Latin joke in case there are any Michael Go fans following this presentation. When I was at primary school, I really see it now as an age of innocence, when I felt that education and the curriculum was about helping me learn. But here we see me on my last day of innocence as I, dressed in my cap and blazer and setting off for my secondary school, to find out that curriculum is not about learning and about people, but it's about subjects. And the first great piece of learning I made on that subject was on the Latin versus art controversy. There was no controversy in the first year, one did Latin and art. But at the end of the first year, one took an exam. In fact, one took exams in all the subjects. And if one passed the Latin exam, one took Latin and gave up art. If one passed the art exam and the Latin exam, one still gave up art and took Latin. Only if one failed the Latin exam did one take art, irrespective of whether one had passed any art exam or not. That was my first appreciation that subjects were not all equal. Some subjects were definitely more equal than others. Throughout the 60s, for those of you who were not around then, I don't think many of you here tonight have been, we had the Arts versus the Sciences, and we had C.P. Snow desperately trying to bridge the gap between what would now be probably called the STEM subjects and the Arts. But we weren't fooled. We knew that somehow the Arts had a higher place in the order of things, and us mere scientists were not quite in the same boat. But as I went through and did science in the sixth form and I discovered geology in the sixth form, I learned one very important lesson, that there are actually more than ten subjects. The ten subjects that appear to be like the ten commandments on the tablets of stone handed down in today's national curriculum. Indeed, of course, in those days we didn't even have a national curriculum, something which now appears to make educators quail with horror, when in fact we seem to do quite well. Leaping forward a little to the next major subject controversy I can remember was during the 90s when I by this time was teaching IT or was I teaching ICT because we had a wrangle throughout the 90s which now appears to be erased from many people's memory about the difference between IT and ICT and the idea of moving from IT, a subject about hardware, to ICT which focused on a range of skills and capabilities linked with the use of technologies. A little later, in fact in 2003, I remember in my role then as head of ICT at SSAT leading discussions which got me quite annoyed about the inability of those leading and managing ICT, whether in schools or indeed in the department, to grasp that ICT was quite such a broad church that it covers a range of aspects of what could be loosely called ICT, and indeed was loosely called ICT in a number of our publications coming out of the department, that failed to distinguish between the different aspects. I always said there were four dimensions at least to ICT. The first was basic skill, or what might be then called e-literacy, now would probably be called digital literacy. The idea of the capability and familiarity in using and handling technologies that all people will need, whatever their job is going to be in the future, whatever walk of life they're in. The skills agenda, although many would argue that it was more about capability than skills. The second dimension, which in 2003 was quite the fore, was what was then called embedded ICT, the idea of the use of these technologies that was so deeply linked within a particular area, it would be stupid to treat it in isolation from the subject which it was its natural home. So, for example, we would have CAD CAM being taught in technology rather than as a separate ICT. Similarly, data logging would be handled in science or in geography rather than being taught in an ICT curriculum. In those days, the Cinderella subject was, in fact, what we might call the, the ICT as a subject in its own right, the specialism. Indeed, at that time, Charles Clark deemed it not a subject uh, or a specialism, and it was seen as something that pervaded all subjects, ignoring the fact that at that time, a seventh of the UK workforce was working in an area that they would identify as IT. I, they felt they were in a vocational area, the IT industry. This is an area that, although it was quite well understood, it seemed to be at FE and higher level, was not much understood at school. 
The fourth area for ICT in schools was in fact the idea of ICT as a tool to help in the business, engineering the business, so things like management information systems and e-learning systems and so on. Now I think we've revised some of that thinking with the new debate about whether it should be ICT or computer science, almost reinventing the argument from the 90s about the difference between ICT and IT. And I think the arguments that held true then still hold true now, that ICT is more than computer science. Just before giving this talk, I watched a rerun on BBC Two of the Magical Mystery Tour from the Beatles, in which a tent looking somewhat like this one features, and a whole host of people pour into the tent and apparently get magically swallowed up. And sometimes my view of the curriculum is exactly that, that we have this big tent curriculum, so-called, except it's quite a small tent, with ten subjects being painfully rammed into far too small a space, leading into far too content-heavy curriculum. And it strikes me that actually the debate that we have at the moment is more where we have people trying to uh, have computer science going into an e-back, which is a sort of a posh inner tent inside the larger curriculum tent. And I just really do question the value, the ethics of having a subject, any subject, being deemed to be of more value than another and the idea that there is a moral high ground to be had by scrabbling to get computer science within the EBAC, which in itself is a pretty execrable idea. Others can say far more about the inappropriateness of the EBAC and the better alternatives, and I would just direct you to John Tom's It's This Much I Know blog if you wish to find somebody far more eloquent on why it's the wrong path to go down. I would say that for several years we have not been short of vision about what the nature of the true digital literacy in ICT curriculum could be, whether we call it steamed or whatever. It's certainly broader than the narrow, somewhat sterile debate that we get in the computer, science or STEM agendas. For the 21st century, we need to look at the work of people like Ian Livingstone, David Putnam, and Ken Robinson highlighting what real creativity is about and showing that it's just as important to get the arts and media into the new technologies arena as it is the technical if we are to have Britain as a thriving 21st century economy. Indeed, when one looks at the formal curriculum as against the informal curriculum, I think it can be argued that many of those who have succeeded in the computer science arena have had as their primary learning place the bedroom rather than the classroom. We have a lot of very successful young programmers, nearly all of whom have developed their skills through determination, drive and are seeking out something that they wish to do themselves rather than achieving this through the formal curriculum. I do not say it's not doable through the formal curriculum or that we shouldn't have teachers that are doing this, but to imply that the only answer to the ICT dilemma is to have the mainstream core of all students undergoing programming strikes me as a slightly false approach. The key learning skills that people now face could be argued to be entrepreneurial, indeed, rather than the programming. Nowadays, we need to have children who are enabled not just to get a job, but to actually create a job. And if coding skills are underdeveloped in schools, how much less well-developed are our abilities to help young people become entrepreneurs and actually take what skills they wish to use and apply them in creating a new job and a new business that they can move forward with. At a recent event near Silicon Roundabout, I was talking to people who were desperately looking to recruit new graduates to their technology industries. What were they looking for? Was it programmers? No. It was psychology graduates, English graduates and media studies graduates. They desperately needed human interface designers and found that though they can usually recruit enough programmers to fill their vacancies, it is the much more difficult skills of human interface design that they find that they are challenged to fill and indeed that the best people fitted to learn these skills come from these psychology, English and media studies backgrounds, rather than the technology ones. In closing, I would just remind us of Albert Einstein's important observation. Thank you for listening.